So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so, we are going to have uh, our new chapter about IO systems. Uh, so, in this uh, chapter, we are going to talk about IO systems, especially first time of the uh, lecture where we just a uh, uh, brief overview of uh, computer organization. Uh, topics about IO and so on, and then we are going to talk about how operating system handles IO, uh, take care of IO uh, devices and the complexity, different devices, device driver software, and so on. So we we cannot consider computation without uh, having IO. It is uh, no uh, closed system will end up in a useful computation. So usually, uh, depending on the task you are trying to solve, uh, our computer is mostly uh, dealing with uh, the I.O. Uh, actually, we have different classes. So if you are making some number crunching applications like solving matrices uh, or encoding of video, decoding of video, and so on, this uh, CPU intensive task and will not make much I.O. Uh, at the end, for playing, for example, encoded video, you might end up in I.O. Uh, but this computation intensive task, but, um, not all of the tasks uh, are like that. Mostly we have uh, I.O. intensive tasks are uh, more common, especially in desktop software, uh, like browsers, editors, uh, word processors and so on, you usually uh, wait for user inputs uh, or uh, if you are having some network interaction, you wait for network and so on. So most of the CPU's time is standing on waiting for I.O. and handling I.O. Uh, so this uh, I.O. system provides all sorts of I.O. available in the, the system. There are a um, variety of different uh, I.O. devices uh, with different data rates, starting with uh, keyboards, uh, which are very slow, like 10 bytes a second, uh, up to uh, in contemporary uh, networking hardware, like uh, like uh, 10G, uh, Ethernet or uh, the uh, new interconnect, it can go up to 40 gigabytes or uh, larger uh, gigabits per second, not quite, sorry. Uh, also, uh, complexity of control uh, varies from device to device. Uh, it's going to be shared, so you need some locking mechanism and so on and so on. Uh, the units of transfer is something else. We are going to talk about this in details in device drivers. Uh, so it can be just stream of byte like the keyboards, or it can be block based like a hard disk. Uh, they will have different data rep representations, so you can have different encodings and operating system involved in this, handling errors, parities, and so on. Uh, we can have uh, error handling can be different. We, you, we have devices that requires retry, like hard disk, we can retry and succeed, succeed, or we just fail with some failure report. Uh, and uh, for uh, speeding up the application, we can have different mechanisms like scheduling, different buffering mechanisms, and so on. Uh, so the operating system's responsibility is to abstract uh, that uh, complex hardware uh, coupled uh, system of I.O. into a simpler form uh, to the uh, user space program. Uh, so uh, providing a uniform and simple interface to the user space so that uh, the details of hardware uh, is not going to be uh, bothering the program. Uh, so, uh, also, I.O. is something specific about uh, vendors involved. That means you can buy different hardware, uh, different uh, peripherals from different vendors, 
and your operating system uh, supports uh, different vendors and vendors also uh, rely on you to support your operating system uh, to, for mutual benefit. As a result, we have uh, various uh, vendors, uh, various brands, and for historical reasons, we may have uh, older standards uh, with backward compatibility and so on. So this will make our uh, picture much more complicated. Uh, so uh, some of the, uh, in order to provide abstraction, uh, some of the facilities are uh, controlled only by kernel and uh, the user access, direct access from user is just forbidden. Uh, but this is not uh, always true, especially for uh, console users. We need uh, special privileges in order to provide direct access to uh, video cards, memory, and uh, video playback, and so on. So there are um, different mechanisms you have to uh, take care of in order to provide its uh, exceptions and so on. So IS system looks like this. Uh, at the top, we have user programs, uh, which needs to be uh, simpler. So we have operating system. Between them, we have system call interface, uh, or system API, if you may call it. Uh, and then we have uh, operating system involving the device drivers. And in each device, we have hardware-based uh, or firmware-based uh, controllers. And device drivers uh, interact with the controller. Uh, so all hardware specific details are in this uh, device driver software. And we have abstraction levels up to operating system. And from operating system, we have another uh, abstraction, which is system calls. We end up in the user programs. Uh, so each IO request from user program is converted into some system call, system call. Uh, makes a call to device driver, and device driver will uh, take necessary actions like updating registers and so on, uh, set up in the device and so on, re reading or writing the device, and then uh, reporting the result to the user program. Uh, so uh, one issue about the architecture of the computer also, how to access the SIO devices, how to interact with them, and uh, which categories exist and so on. Uh, especially we can uh, end up uh, in uh, three basic categories. Uh, one, uh, one distinction is character versus block. So we have four categories, character devices, block devices. Uh, in order to provide a network uh, layer uh, implementations, uh, we have some specific uh, handling of network interface cards. And then uh, graphics are there, especially uh, in the last 20, 30 years, they use too much acceleration and actually have a powerful uh, GPU uh, in the card. So it needs to access memory directly and so on uh, for rendering purposes. So we have special handling for graphics card or such special uh, hardware. Uh, there may be some computation accelerators and security devices and so on. They may need to have some uh, special tapping of memory and so on. Uh, so uh, the um, one uh, basic uh, way of access is uh, actually a port-based access and the commands and so on. Uh, it is uh, provided by uh, the communication between the operating system and the device controller. We usually send commands on some uh, wires uh, through registers and so on. And then we get the results in other uh, registers and it will go like that. Uh, so uh, the um, operating system perspective of uh, this IO operations is through registers. Operating systems update registers, but actually it may be uh, transferred into actual hardware uh, hardware signals uh, and it will uh, be received by the device controller and so on and vice versa. Uh, the address of such registers are uh, 
done through different uh, approaches uh, in different way. Uh, we have memory-based I/O, port-based I/O, and hybrid I/O. So in uh, memory-based uh, memory-mapped I/O, uh, we don't have special uh, I/O instructions. Uh, parts of the memory uh, are reserved for uh, I/O device. And if you write in specific address of memory, it is actually uh, registered in the uh, network, uh, the I/O device, and that register will end up in some sending command or sending status or reading some address will end up in reading status of the device and so on. Uh, in uh, port-based I.O., the left-hand side is the port base, the middle one is memory uh, map. Uh, we have uh, two different address space, uh, the I.O. port address space and the memory, and we uh, send input output instructions on ports to send uh, set registers or send data, receive data, and so on. And the uh, hybrid approach is the combination of those. We have I.O. ports, but also in order to take advantage of memory and mapped I.O., uh, we have also some address space dedicated to the uh, device so that the device can directly write uh, access through this memory operations. Uh, uh, so, the, so the hardware provides uh, an option for the uh, device. The device can use IO ba uh, port based or uh, memory map uh, access. Uh, so in memory map, uh, we have a single address space, so we have single bus. So uh, when your program is making an IO, it writes into bus to the IO. If address fits I.O., it will go read by this I.O. Uh, device. If it is in main memory, it will be uh, taken by this. So this address bus controls, uh, depending on the address, the bus will uh, deliver your data to I.O. device or the memory. In the uh, port-based I.O., we have a, uh, we have two buses. One is an I/O bus, and the other one is the usual memory bus. In this way, uh, we can have a parallel uh, access of memory versus I/O. Uh, in this way, we can execute an I/O instruction and memory access in parallel by the CPU. We have uh, many uh, different hardware interfaces uh, in contemporary CPUs. Uh, we have CPU, uh, we have memory bus, we go through memory, or we have a PCI bridge. So it will uh, connect us to the PCI devices. Some of those devices have further uh, buses, like SCSI and USB. So we can have USB devices here, go through this uh, hardware interface controller, host interface controller. And uh, the host adapter in SCSI will uh, lead us to different uh, disks connected to the same controller. Also, same as network uh, and video controller and so on. And we can have, for example, wireless here. Uh, Bluetooth is an option. We have Bluetooth uh, devices and so on. Uh, so, uh, this bus is an interconnected thing, the component. So, uh, each component can communicate with CPU, and sometimes uh, they uh, may have uh, direct memory access as well. Uh, port is uh, the uh, interface uh, for uh, when you plug a device, it, this address will be available so that CPU can access that device. Uh, and device controllers are the actual uh, hardware devices. Uh, connecting device to the system bus. Uh, so we have a uh, coupling between the device driver and the device controller. In the operating system, handler of that hardware is called device driver. And uh, the, uh, in the device, uh, the hardware component that is responsible with interaction, uh, responsible uh, for interaction of the, the operating system is called the device controller. 
so uh, sometimes we can have a single controller uh, able to handle multiple devices. Uh, and uh, usually what they do is uh, there can be uh, different characteristics of IO combine them into blocks or they might be parallel uh, IO uh, request combine into and or uh, sequence them into some sequence of commands, also error corrections, etc. Uh, this is a typical IO port range for Intel based uh, devices. Uh, since PCI and before that, we have plug and play interface, uh, those ports are uh, dynamically uh, decided. Uh, these are the typical values, but they can be changed and uh, the operating system can probe hardware, the main motherboard, and get this list and depending on that, decide on which port contains which device and so on. Uh, so basic uh, story of I.O., uh, the sequence of I.O. is uh, ruled by these four uh, registers. Uh, depending on word site, uh, those uh, register size can be different. Uh, so we have the status register, which is uh, purpose is to get the status from the device controller. Command registers purpose is to send command to the uh, device controller. Uh, and uh, for input, we use another register. For output, we use another register. So basically, those four registers uh, will uh, make IO possible. So uh, the host, the operating system, reads these status bytes. And that disk may include the uh, device controller is busy. busy if command is completed or if data is available or, or if there is an error uh, occurred in during last uh, uh, cycle uh, and so on. Uh, so depending on uh, the type of IO, it may be different, for example, for uh, reading data, if data available or for writing data, if uh, device control is ready to get data and so on. In the command register, we have a set of commands uh, known by both parties, of course. Device driver has to know which commands are uh, available in the device controller. And uh, that command can be like uh, read or write or uh, setting some configuration, some, for example, reset and so on. It can be such command. Uh, we have a data in registers. Uh, so we usually uh, send a read command first and then uh, probe status, if data is available, we fetch this register to get the data. Uh, in the data out register, if uh, uh, device is ready, we uh, put some value into this register, then send a write command so that device controller again can get the data out of this data out uh, byte. Uh, so the device driver and device controller are two different entities and they completely work in a synchronous parallel fashion. And only way uh, for them to um, uh, cooperate is to negotiate through this uh, status and command registers. Uh, and uh, in order not to miss some of the data to be written or the data to read, they need to cooperate uh, and uh, make this uh, register updates uh, atomic. So, you, uh, so uh, we may have mechanisms like uh, waiting or we, the locking and so on involving in this process. Um, so usually we have uh, this loop. Uh, the, uh, Basically, this is a typical poll-based uh, I.O. Uh, though, so the uh, so so this is uh, the right command. So basically, we have this parts. Uh, 
uh, so in this part you have your scenes waiting so this is a busy waste a busy wait case we have uh, while the status register is uh, busy we will wait wait until uh, device controller can serve us and we write the device data out data byte so first make the data available then we set this uh, right bit and ready bit so that device controller will do uh, the a semantic version of this it is going to uh, wait until command is ready and it will make status busy and read this command uh, from this uh, part uh, here uh, the that part is uh, available so in this part we get the comment if comment is right we take the data out of the us data out and uh, if actual uh, io writing to the devices the hardware based io is a success we report that in the status otherwise we report errors in the status and note that this yellow part is by hardware and it's not part of your operating system and so you don't care how good this is done we are interested in this uh, operating system part of this story uh, so uh, now Uh, this is an example of printing. We have a string to be printed, so we send that data to the printers, and uh, then uh, the kernel space, the device driver, takes this buffer, and it sends to the printer byte by byte, A, B, C, D, and so on, loop until the end of the string. And this uh, setting data out, waiting until it is not busy setting data out, uh, sending commands, and so on. This loop is repeated for uh, each and every character. Uh, and this is the user part of the story, uh, assuming there is no, uh, so this, not the user part, but uh, after copying from users, uh, what happens? printing uh, of some strings. We have this uh, until end of the buffer. We uh, wait until it is not ready, output the character and uh, go on. But uh, we have a major issue here. Uh, the major issue is uh, this instruction is uh, easy wait. Uh, if you remember, Busy wait is something we don't like. Why we don't like that? Because our CPU can make much more useful things instead of uh, checking a byte again, 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 and again. But it will waste our CPU. Uh, it has more power consumption. Uh, and it has uh, stealing from the user's uh, space program CPU size. Uh, one solution here is instead of doing that, you can sleep here. Okay? So what you can do basically is you can delete the semicolon here. And instead, put a curly brace here. And you basically sleep. Sleep for a while. Sleep for some delta t time. Okay. But we have a but here. Uh, the well, if we have such a variable, what will be the value of delta t? 
is it gonna, gonna be microseconds, milliseconds, or a second? Okay. If you make it a small uh, number, like nanoseconds, it will turn out into something similar to this way. If you uh, make it too large, like a half a second, for example, in that case, uh, your IO will be uh, done after at most half a second. So you are pressing a key, half a second later operating system will uh, see that ready and start reading it. Uh, so still uh, sleeping uh, doesn't solve our problem. Of course, I am not talking about users stay sleeping here. Uh, the kernel device driver may, making something useful while waiting. Okay, do something else and go back here after that amount of time. So how do we fix that? The solution is uh, the interrupts. Uh, so basically, it is uh, provided by hardware. Usually, since it is uh, uh, time uh, combining all of the interrupts into a single line is something we like. Uh, we like to minimize number of lines to the CPU, so that instead of having uh, many uh, wires uh, of interrupt going in CPU. They go in some interrupt controller and interrupt controller will uh, communicate CPU and uh, convert that into some uh, interrupt. Uh, so uh, take some load out of the CPU, this interrupt control is doing that. Uh, so uh, how interrupts are hand handled is when uh, interrupt in controller generates an interrupt, the operating system usually uh, adjust an interrupt service routine and it is called uh, when an interrupt is generated and for each device you can have a different isr and based on that we can have different handling strategies so uh, by help of uh, interrupts now uh, we don't have to deal with uh, the uh, the polling of the operations. So interrupt handler, we, we send our command and interrupt handler will uh, let us know when uh, the command uh, has finished or data is ready or if there is an error. So whatever event is occurring here, whatever event you are after in this status register or if any changes uh, occur in the status register, we will we may be informed by this interrupt. Uh, so uh, with this mechanism, our CPUs doesn't have to reservate uh, on uh, device uh, status. Uh, this is the case is here uh, at F1 device driver initiates IO and CPU starts doing something useful here. Uh, so it sends uh, next responsible to the IO controller. IO controller does its thing, whatever it is doing, IO, etc. And when input is ready or it is uh, operation is finished or if there's some status change, it wakes up CPU and CPU will get it and uh, continue uh, processing data and so on. So this processing data is taking uh, data in uh, register value or uh, sending the next value and so on. It may be like that. Uh, so uh, this uh, useful thing actually it is instead of sleeping, it is waiting for an event and that event is triggered by uh, interrupt. So in uh, the interface, I our uh, scenario turns out into uh, this. We uh, take the user data, we enable interrupts. Uh, we wait until printer is ready, send the bytes, 
and instead of waiting for next cycle uh, in some busy wait, we call scheduler. That means I want to do something useful. I, I'm not going to wait for that. And uh, when I, uh, ISR is available, it is going to get, wake up, and start the next cycle and go. Uh, so in this way, our IO can be activated. Uh, basically, um, uh, uh, the uh, IO part is uh, a long part, that's complicated part. So in order to take care of this uh, IO instructions and so on, uh, we usually have uh, kernel level threads uh, in order to uh, make this one, uh, the ISR shorter. So shorter ISR will work better because uh, it will have a lower chance of uh, preemption. We are going to talk about that in a moment. So we have uh, other issues as also uh, we have um, uh, deferring the interrupts in uh, critical processing. So interrupts can be uh, deferred, so broken and then uh, resumed back. Uh, we can have multi-level interrupts, high priority and low priority interrupts, uh, so that uh, when you are handling uh, a unimportant uh, IO uh, device that might be an important one. So you preempt this interrupt. So uh, during interrupt service routine, you don't disable interrupt so that new interrupts can be handled. So we have re-entrant uh, interrupts handlers, uh, preempting others and so on is possible. Uh, there are actually two types of uh, interrupt request lines, non-maskable, for errors, basically, and muscle ones are used by device controllers. Uh, and sometimes uh, you can, uh, in the kernel, you mask the interrupts. Masking the interrupt is not losing them, but uh, it's just uh, stopping ISR uh, for a while. And then when uh, you are ready, you unmask it so that ISR will be raised and start again. Uh, Usually those uh, ranges are uh, too short. We have to keep them too short so that we don't uh, lose uh, uh, new interrupts coming from the same device. Or if device control has a timeout, we don't like to reach that timeout. So that's why we have ISR sets so we get short as short as possible. Uh, so this interrupt mechanism needs to address different interrupts. So if we have 50 different devices, we need to address them. Usually we have uh, interrupt uh, vectors so that each interrupt number is handled by a different service and each device uses a different uh, vector entry so that uh, those numbers uh, will match devices to the uh, functions within the kernel. Uh, since we have limited uh, size in those vectors, we have this interrupt chaining, that means uh, multiple devices, especially slow devices, use the uh, same interrupt numbers. And when ISR is raised, it will check which device that interrupt is coming from. If it is not uh, for me, I follow my chain and follow my chain. And based on that, I decide the next one. So basically, it looks like this. We have this vector. If it is not chain, it is going to indicate some C function, my ISR. But if many devices are using this interrupt like this, this is going to go to some C instructions and is going to test if for me, If it is so, it is going to continue. Otherwise, it's going to follow the chain and 
go to another one. We're going to test um, follow the chain or and in this way, the single interrupt number will uh, provide uh, different uh, hammers and uh, different ISRs. Also, prior to levels, as I mentioned, uh, we may have preemption of uh, interrupts uh, depending on different uh, priorities. Uh, so uh, for uh, interrupt service things, I can show you uh, some uh, example from a Linux machine. So here, uh, so this is a Linux machine. Uh, I would like to show you first this uh, proc interrupts file, which has the current setup of interrupts in my system. Uh, this is a quad core uh, 8 thread uh, CPU. And this is my interrupt uh, vector, basically, interrupt 0189. In the kernel, uh, they are handled uh, so that each is used by uh, at least one of the uh, functions. Some of them are internal kernel functions, some of them are related to devices. For example, this one is a Ethernet device, this one. Uh, so this number denotes uh, how many of that interrupt is generated uh, uh, from start of the boot of the machine. So as you can see, my network has 275 million times generating uh, interrupt. Uh, we have real-time clock, we have timer interrupt, USB-based interrupts. Uh, this is my graphic cards, Radeon, this is for sound cards, and the CPU. Uh, these are non muscle and these are internal uh, interrupts. We have TIV shutdowns. Yeah, I don't exactly know the internals of that. Uh, so any, for example, there should be some wireless device here. Okay, so these are uh, ISRs and uh, so there is a kernel function for all of them and it is handling uh, the requests. Uh, but since ISRs has to be short, what uh, operating systems usually do is uh, having a special uh, tasks or threads, if you may call them processes as well, but uh, what they do is, this is the process table, uh, so all the square brackets are uh, uh, called kernel threads. So usually these device drivers uh, generate uh, some start, uh, not generate, but start uh, kernel threads, and what they do is they handle this device I.O. in some loop, and what uh, ISRs do is ISRs simply uh, trigger this thread. So th this thread usually sleep, and when there's an ISR, they will be waken up and deal with IO and go back. So so that we don't have to uh, do all of the processing in this ISR. So it is like uh, so we will have. Uh, ISR having a large codes lasting microseconds. Microseconds is a long time for a CPU. Uh, versus we have a kernel thread here. Wait for some events and then do some action. And ISR is doing raise events. And there, there is some sort of producer-consumer relation between them. So there's a wait queue, 
the kernel trace based on weight queue, and ISR will in insert new requests to the weight queue and uh, go back so that we will have very short ISRs versus kernel threads are dealing uh, with the uh, actual IO interaction. Uh, so returning back to the slides. So I need to clear my partition. Okay. Um, now uh, we have another issue, and that issue is about uh, this time. So with interrupts, we uh, get rid of some of the uh, extra thing we need to do. Uh, is not some of the, but we uh, we get rid of the we got rid of the visa way, but still, as you can see, we have this operation. For each byte, we have to write something. Assume this is a large block, like four kilobytes of data. We have to do this 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes, 10 bytes, and this is done by CPU. And it is uh, also something we don't like. Our CPU uh, is too precious so that we don't uh, like to waste any cycle of it. So if it is possible to make this one as more efficient or not. And uh, for that, we have a, a, another hardware help, not operating system, but hardware help, which we call DMA. Uh, so uh, this DMA is uh, providing us, the DMA hardware is providing us uh, uh, this copying of buffers uh, between main memory of the computer and the device memory uh, done by the special hardware, the DMA uh, hardware. So that, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, operation of copying byte by byte by sending some buffer from uh, device uh, to main memory is offloaded to this special hardware. The special hardware is capable of handling uh, the, uh, the controlling the uh, system bus so that it can steal some of the cycles out of the bus and when CPU is not accessing main memory, it can directly access the main memory and uh, provide this uh, copying of buffers. Okay. So it is uh, actually something like this. So our uh, DMA is... So if you remember, we have this... Uh, we have our CPU, we have our memory, and assume we have another box, which is our DMA controller, and all of them are connected to something we call a bus. And so they are all connected to the bus. And we have CPU, we have memory, sorry. we have memory, and we have DMA. And uh, at the end, we have We have the uh, device, okay, and this is uh, our device, and it is connected to bus in a similar way. So uh, now our task is to get some data out of uh, the device into to IO instructions, of course. Uh, Get some data out uh, of this uh, device. 
to execute actually this IO instruction to the uh, IO controller and so get some written to the memory directly. And CPU can also making some IO instructions at the moment, but between them, the DMA controller sends, uh, gets this and sends this to the memory so that uh, the uh, transfer of uh, bytes from IO device to the memory or memory to IO device uh, does not uh, use CPU. And this is our uh, basic purpose. So this is done by setting up DMA controller and then uh, letting it start. And when DMA controller uh, is finished, it is going to let us know through which mechanism interrupts. So uh, in a typical scenario, device driver is told to transfer this data to some buffers and address. So DMA will know which address uh, or in memory to be used and which block at the device, which command to send to the device. Uh, and then it will send the command to the uh, this controller and it's going to initiate the DMA transfer and the buffer is sent to the DMA controller. Uh, and when uh, data is ready, all data is transferred, there will be an interrupt. So the data can be uh, processed. Uh, this is a typical picture of uh, a system. Uh, so for each component, uh, we have a different uh, abstraction. So in the kernel, we have different subsystem. Uh, for user processes, we have the interface as system calls. When system calls are uh, executing, they are actually inside of kernel, so they can or any other kernel uh, function. And they uh, start accessing IOS uh, subsystem uh, and they will, the IO system is the general abstraction over all types of hardware, device drivers, and it will uh, dispatch the corresponding device driver. Device driver will send the command through interrupts or whatever mechanism it is to the actual hardware and actual hardware, hardware will send back data or uh, report success failure and the reporting of the operations will go back to user process. And uh, if you see, if you can uh, notice this is a complex picture because there are many different uh, device drivers considering uh, there are uh, historical versions, some of the uh, device drivers have historical buses like uh, EDA, for example, EDA support and so on. Uh, also, there are many vendors, different types. Uh, this picture can be much more uh, complicated. Okay, so uh, what we need is uh, the operating system should provide some uh, simpler interface uh, and that simpler interface will be used by the user process and it will be uh, let us access the hardware. Uh, but it is not the end of the story. Uh, there are different device types. It should be powered, graphic card network interface and so on. New devices should be added. So when there is a new chip invented, the chip designed by someone uh, with some capabilities, it should be introduced to your operating system. Uh, it might be in the existing class of hardware, it, it may fit, or it may be a, a bright new invention. So you should have some, you should be open to that as well. Okay. Uh, a new bus, for example, a new bus type. We didn't have Bluetooth. Like 20 years ago, like that. Uh, also, plug and play is something important, uh, especially introdu introduction of uh, devices like USB and uh, wireless devices and so on. 
the new devices can be added at any time. So we should have reduction of them, reservation of ports for them, uh, and so on. So uh, it is something especially involving hardware as well. Uh, so we usually have a special buses for this plug and play uh, type uh, devices, and those buses will signal up the uh, attachment of the new, new device or uh, removal of the new uh, removal of the device and so on. Uh, also, another issue is uh, since we have many chipsets, many different device drivers, if you put all of the support in the operating system uh, during compilation, uh, you will end up in a very large kernel binary and it is not manageable. Uh, instead of that, uh, we have modularization. Uh, each device driver can be loaded as a dynamic module. So when you, for example, attach a new device, it is dynamically loaded. Uh, the device driver code is dynamically loaded so that it will be uh, serving the new device. Uh, actually, we have like thousands of possibilities. However, in an actual hardware, in your desktop machine, there are only at most uh, 50 of them available. So you will have only 50 device drivers loaded in your kernel uh, memory. Uh, okay. So uh, this complexity, different vendors, different drivers, different types, different classes, is quite uh, large. And uh, one uh, major problem here is uh, if you uh, like to have uh, a different, sorry, if you try to get a different API for SCSI, a different API for keyboard, a different API for mouse, different API for USB device, Bluetooth, and so on. Uh, you will end up in a very complicated API here, or system API, or set of system calls here. So you need to minimize your system calls. Uh, I didn't talk about the vendors. If we have each vendor having its own API in the user space, it is unmanageable. So one of the uh, advantages of having a real operating system is uh, to get rid of that complexity. Operating system should make your life easier in that sense. So uh, in order to solve that problem, what operating system do, uh, systems do is uh, basically uh, unifying uh, the interface in the user space. So instead of uh, having many uh, different uh, set of functions for each different device, uh, they have a simpler classification. Like in Unix, we have character devices, lock devices, network devices, and especially graphics hardware, the special hardware. And uh, each of them have special interface. Uh, basically, character and block devices are very similar interface. Network has some socket interface. And GPU can have like uh, direct rendering methods or DRI and so on. We have uh, special kernel uh, modules to handle uh, that specific hardware. But uh, the idea is the user space doesn't have to deal with that complexity. Uh, also, addressing of the uh, devices is another issue, another complexity. The Unix solution is very simple. Uh, they didn't add much uh, system call into their list of system calls because they use uh, existing uh, set of system calls, basically the file-related operations, which are also valid for files as well. 
class one new guy in the town, which is IOCTL. The uh, IOCTL is for configuring. So the IO devices have the special requirement. You need to configure them. For example, speed of them, resetting of them, and so on. You need special command. For that, they have a special system call. Otherwise, it's like accessing a file. So what they did is, the Unix designers did is, uh, having each device visible as a file. So when you uh, assume that you are writing a file, you are actually uh, making I.O. And this is called the special file. Special file are in the file system as if uh, they are regular files, but they are not regular. If you try to access them, read, write, and so on, what you do is actually doing I.O. And this is done by special uh, type marking. Let me show you. So, so this is my Linux machine again. I will just keep out. So this is uh, MacOS. I can show you similar things in MacOS as well. So if you see this uh, Mac machine, you will see some special files starting with C. This is slash dev directory. Uh, some of them are starting with B. C means character device. B means uh, block device. And you will see A sequence of such devices. Some of them are TTYs, some of them are pseudo devices. But the idea is, for example, when you write something to this TTYS000, you actually write the terminal. Or if I can go to my And this is the same picture in Linux. You will see different devices. Uh, for example, this is mouse. So we basically, you can try this at home if you have a Linux machine. So if you play with mouse, you will see some garbage characters here. It's not garbage, actually. It is a stream coming from that uh, mouse. Uh, since I'm not connected to that machine, I cannot do that show for you. And because it behaves differently. So, uh, or there is no uh, line printer device currently connected to line machine, but if you have a line printer device uh, connected, if you catch something, if you write something to that device, it will be coming off from your printer and so on. So these are all uh, possible. Uh, I would like you to focus on these numbers. Uh, I can actually do another thing, for example. This is SDA. SDA is my boot disk in the system. And if you do so, you can see first blocks of your hard disk. So you are actually writing, uh, reading a file in your file system. That is a block device. So it is actually a hardware device. And this 80 is the thing I'm going to mention in the next slide. Okay, now, uh, these numbers are called major and minor numbers. Uh, the major number selects the device drivers, and minor number selects the actual device within uh, the list of devices handled by device drivers. So you have, we have a hard disk device driver, uh, and if you can have 20, 30 hard disks, and they are all handled by that device driver. So major device, major number will be the same. 
but you will have 30 different minor devices, each is pointing to a different hardware device. In this case, uh, for example, in this picture, uh, the partitions of the hard disk will have different numbers. And for TTY, for example, your system's TTY will have different numbers. So this is your console device. And zero will be your first console. One will be second, two will be third, and so on. How you handle that? Basically, device driver code is a kernel code. It is a C code. Usually, it's a function. So when you, for example, open a special file, uh, the system will have this device driver switch, which is a table, a table of device drivers. So in eight entry, we will have our uh, hard disk uh, device drivers. It has such a structure. In this structure, we will have pointers for function, so set of function pointers. Uh, it is similar to object-oriented programming but it's a C. So uh, I would like to invoke open method of this device. So I follow the open function pointers and open function pointers points to this uh, SD open. So when I open the SDA, I invoke this one with the minor number as a parameter. So the open will know which how this guy likes to access. Then I invoke a read from the device driver switch. I am going to follow read. Read is here. The minor number is known. So it will uh, initiate an IO for the uh, hard disk zero, for example, based on this uh, minor number. And it is going to give me the result. Uh, so basically, it will turn out into this, this device switch eight. Follow the read pointer to eight and four will give me that data. Uh, so, uh, uh, basically, device drivers are vendor specific, sometimes written by vendors, sometimes by the operating system uh, designers, uh, programmers. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, the operating system provides a uh, development API to the vendors. Vendors develop their uh, device drivers, and it will be dynamically loaded into the operating system uh, to make it available to the uh, users. Uh, and uh, we have uh, we may have a, a driver which is capable of handling different. Uh, vendors especially chipset is the same uh, however it is it has some class so the, the mouse driver for example is not for writing something so in the mouse drivers usually we don't have this write code write code is unimplemented if you try to write a mouse it is simply ignored or you will get an error so uh, Uh, the, these are defined by operating system. Uh, the uh, device driver has, uh, in addition to uh, serving the user space, has also uh, other uh, responsibilities like initialization of the hardware. So when it is first plugged in, it will send some initialization code. Uh, also, monitoring of hardware so that it can be unplugged, it may be, it may be on operational power of, maybe out of uh, battery, and so on. Uh, these are uh, actually events to be uh, reported to the uh, operating uh, system. Uh, so, in the uh, device drivers, it has to keep track of some basic tasks. Uh, it will uh, validate the input parameters, uh, and it, there is a, there might be some uh, addressing issues. Like uh, in hard disks, for example, we have uh, the cylinder track sector number sector numbers uh, as the actual addressing used, but in the 
the user space or the uh, upper layers, you use uh, logical block. So you just give some block address. So basically, the conversion of that is done by the uh, device drivers. Uh, uh, it is uh, monitoring. It is, should monitor the uh, device driver, its such registers, and so on. Uh, sometimes some uh, hardware may be sleeping, so it should wake it up. So it can spin, for example, for a hard disk, hard disk may uh, decide to sleep, uh, especially unused ones, not frequently used ones. So you have to shake it so it will start rolling, and then into the way you can send the command. Uh, sometimes a, C, a single comment is sent, sometimes a sequence of comments. Depending on the bus type, we can have, uh, especially in hard disk, we can have uh, different requests can be sent uh, at the same moment. So you can send 10 comments to the hard disk, others will give you the result. Uh, and the once the data is available or there is an error, it is sent to the Hardware independent parts. Uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, the ISR should be uh, short, so the device driver must be re entered. So uh, when you are handling a uh, notification and message, there might be another one coming. So uh, you should uh, deal with that. So you, you may need, for example, comment queuing sometimes, or uh, you can implement a re-enter code set it so that you will not lose any data. Uh, and uh, the kernel threads is another um, solution. The ISR will be short, and since there is a queuing mechanism, you will not get uh, any uh, request or results uh, lost. Uh, now let us talk a little bit about the classification. If uh, I briefly gave you four types, uh, character and block devices, one uh, basic distinction, especially in Unix world. Uh, this uh, categorization is based on uh, the units of communication. Uh, in character devices, units of communication is a byte, and you basically send sequence of bytes, and the other party will get that sequence of bytes, read or write. Uh, serial ports like parallel ports, uh, printers, mouse, keyboards, uh, audio devices, because audio is sent. Um, uh, in sequence uh, are in this category. Uh, in block devices, the basic unit is the block. So uh, we have some sort of uh, geometry, some partitioning, so that we have block-based access. Uh, the random access, please do not uh, confuse this one with the uh, random access. Even if it's a character device, you might have random access. So depending on some scenario, a character device they have some seek and read like thousand uh, uh, value. It is it is possible uh, in a block device. Uh, in order to uh, make it more efficient, uh, we don't deal with tiny bytes because in the geometry, like in the hard disk, has a block concept already. So you read a whole block. Uh, Reading such some 10 bytes out of it requires all block to be transferred anyway. So you cannot selectively pinpoint a single byte and take it out from a hard disk because its basic unit is the sector. And the sector, in, uh, sector has the same uh, sector with excesses uh, reflected in the block device drivers. Uh, the block device is, can be changed uh, depending on different devices, but kernel has some basic internal block size anyway. Uh, so in uh, block devices, 
in order to update a single byte, you should do this read the whole block, update the byte in memory, and write it back. Uh, Block devices are designed for hard disk, so everything related to disk drives has to be supported. Uh, read, write, seek devices, and block based access. And in addition to that, uh, most importantly, uh, the multiple uh, requests can be sent at the same time. So we have, instead of a single read instruction, we will have a array full of read and write instructions combined. And they are sent as an array. And the hard disk is required. I'm going to talk about the reason in a moment. Uh, also, uh, such devices can use the file system container because file systems require uh, hard disks, block-based access. They are designed for blocks and so on. That's why we have this uh, file system access. Uh, rarely, so the main purpose of this uh, block devices are the file systems, rarely like database applications and so on, or internal use of operating system, we can use direct uh, without file system access of this device. Uh, the device cache is important for block devices. Uh, these block device operations can be cached by the system read and write operations so that they will be much more efficient and it is tightly coupled with uh, the uh, virtual memory and paging subsystem. Uh, you cannot have a file system on a character device. You need a block system. In character devices, uh, we have uh, single byte operations possible, even though it can be buffered internally, like a printer, for example, uh, buffers a whole page, then prints it. Uh, even though it is like that internally, the data is sent as a uh, sequence of bytes, a stream of bytes. Uh, we have modems, uh, keyboards, and uh, mouse uh, printers uh, are in this family. Anything that doesn't need a whole block or it, it that may not have a file system in this cloud. Uh, if the uh, switches here, uh, is only for one of them. Uh, the block and character uh, switches are uh, independent from each other. So, for example, major block device eight is different than major uh, major character devices. Uh, the uh, buffering and caching is internal to the character devices. Uh, however, block devices use system stage cache or device cache. Uh, so these are the uh, summary of the differences. Uh, transfer unit, uh, buffering, internal versus system-wide. Uh, file system partitions can be handled or not, or being uh, subject to IO scheduling algorithms. We are going to mention in the following slide. Uh, in character device, you send read, 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 read in sequence. In block devices, you send an array of reads and writes combined. So the caching is important and uh, they are all subject to device cache unless you tell it otherwise uh, because it is uh, efficiency and also it is tied to couple with VM. So if you look into this uh, left hand side, it is a scenario without caching. Uh, you read a couple of bytes. In some cases, it can be a full block, but in that case, what you need to do is you need to allocate the frame of your block size, a physical memory for that. Tell the device driver to read that block from hard disk, specified block, so it is in memory. Then transfer those memories to the uh, user side. Okay, to the users uh, buffers, okay? So if you are reading 10 bytes, it's the same. If you are reading one byte, it's the same. If you are reading a whole block, you may have 
uh, whole block is transferred at the same. If you have multiple blocks, of course, you need to bring in multiple blocks. Uh, on the other uh, side, with cache, we have some additional checks. At the beginning, you check if it is already available because it might be the case that it is also already in the memory. You brought in that page before. So we check that if this given device and block offset, if it is already in memory or not. If it is not, we repeat this left hand side. Allocate the frame, uh, read uh, that block into that new frame and add this frame to the cache. So now it, is, it will be available for the next cycle. Then we continue with this copying. In the next cycle, if someone else is reading the same buffer with the uh, correct permissions, of course, uh, it will hit into this first line. If it is on cache, so it will go directly jump into three and copy the bytes. That's why you are going to observe in a system, your first write will be, first read will be too, uh, too slow compared to your second one, because data is coming from the buffer cache. You can uh, test this actually, uh, read a couple of, uh, read uh, 100 megabytes of data from a file, a new uh, or a file that you didn't access for a long time. Uh, you read 100 megabytes out of that, calculate the checksum, for example. Uh, then, uh, uh, so, uh, so you calculate checksum and so on. And in the next rounds, it will be much more faster. You can test, test this. Um, let us look into the same uh, case for write as well. In the right, we allocate a frame and read the block. So we are going to updating the block. So we have to read it. Uh, if it is smaller than a block, otherwise we don't have to read it actually. Uh, if it is a full block size, we don't have to read it. Then update user bytes within that block and tell device driver to write that uh, content of the block to the device back. So read, update, write. In the uh, test version, it is similar. We first check if the, the device block pair is on the cache. If it is not, do the reading. Otherwise, we don't have to read because it is already on cache. But uh, then update the bytes. But we have something interesting at the end. Uh, it is we don't have any rights. We only mark that cache frame as dirty. So this is dirty, this is updated. Like it is in our virtual memory page. We mark that as dirty. So that if you like to steal this page or clear this cache, you have to write it. So you leave uh, the reason for that is you may have continuous updates. You, you updated 10 bytes of the block and the next round you updated another 20 bytes. Next time you uh, updated your previous update of those 10 bytes and so on. So you have too many updates of the same block, which doesn't require actual writing. Everything is done on computer's memory. Now, uh, uh, who writes them? So if you don't, you only mark and leave it like that. Someone is supposed to write them and we have a special demon for that. Uh, the synchronization demon, sometimes called sync demon. Or, 
Okay, we, we, which uh, may, which may uh, write those dirty pages. So it, what it does is it traverses all of the cache blocks with dirty marking, and if it is dirty, go start an IO for uh, writing of actual writing or forcing of them on the uh, hardest. Uh, the period of operation for such a demon is another uh, fine tuning issue. If it is too short, uh, you don't get any cache speed up. Uh, you actually turn out into writing everything. Uh, only the user space doesn't wait for them. Uh, if it is too long, you get some risk, and your risk is power failure. If power fails, you lost some data. Uh, this is the point you realize that proper shutdown of computers is important. The, if you do not properly shut down your computer, the sync demon doesn't uh, write some of the dirty pages. And especially if those dirty pages are in the uh, file system metadata, the data structure of the file system, we are going to talk about that, uh, you will lose some of the files completely. At least you will lose some of the blocks within the files, but you may also, because of this metadata, you can metadata, you can lose complete files as well. Uh, the uh, mapping of device block to cache, so given device and the block offset, give me if it is in the cache or not, is uh, kept on a hash table. Uh, and uh, the things get more complicated for page eviction and free memory management. Uh, so they are tightly coupled to each other, including SWAP. So the operations of SWAP are similar to cache uh, enforcement on disk and so on. Uh, so in page eviction, also the some of the cache pages can be evicted as well and so on. Uh, the next thing is, we mentioned all block devices are subject to device cache. Uh, we have some additional cache mechanism available. Uh, sometimes both are available. Sometimes only device cache is available. Uh, we have file cache. However, it works in the file system level. Instead of device block, we have file block to uh, frame mapping. Uh, IOCTL is the single function for configuring the uh, device, but this is quite uh, device driver specific, vendor specific, sometimes vendor specific, so uh, it is a generic uh, design uh, of an API. We open the device file, then provide all a long request ID. Uh, it depends on the device driver. So you will have a huge list of different supported requests, followed by some optional uh, long or pointers. That means you can put your uh, request data in a structure and pass a pointer to it, or you can simply give a number here, or some request doesn't have a number at all. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to this uh, minimum uh, interface, uh, the libc and the kernel uh, doesn't have to be updated for each different device drivers. Uh, this, the vendor or the device driver provides is request ID, uh, the programmer used. Um, so if I should show you, In the main page of IOCTL, you will see uh, how IOCTL is uh, 
used. And if you are interested in the special devices, you can uh, call their uh, For different uh, device types, we can have different IOCTS uh, instructions. Uh, For TTY, for example, the terminals, we have those requests are handled and they are listed here. And if you like, we can have this TTY interface uh, defined. So in uh, page four, you can, uh, the menu page category four, you can find uh, for each device. For your device, you can find the corresponding for your CTN instructions and how it is handled, uh, the instructions and so on can be found here. Uh, so this is a Linux detail, by the way. Uh, so going back to slides, uh, what about Windows? Windows have a special uh, API, which is called WDK, Windows Device Framework. Uh, it provides both uh, interface for user and kernel developers or renders uh, for device drivers uh, development. They have this device uh, access API uh, providing, to the, providing the application level access to devices. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, in Windows, we have device shortcuts uh, on file system again, but they are not uh, like regular files, just uh, shortcuts. If you follow those shortcuts, uh, you hit the uh, device. Uh, so if we repeat the categorization, we have uh, character devices, block devices, block uh, devices that allow random access or only sequential access. Uh, asynchronous versus asynchronous. So there's um, the I/O operations in the operating system part. The device driver has to be synchronized, so uh, they always uh, require attention of the operating system. Or you just send the request and with some non-deterministic time, it will respond. And the second case is called asynchronous. The other is asynchronous. Uh, especially uh, more more primitive uh, hardware required, for example, dealing with uh, triggering to lines, hardware lines, and so on. So they need synchronous uh, operation. Uh, buffered versus direct. Uh, so if your data directly goes or buffered or not, uh, shareable or dedicated hard disk is shared. So there might be many processes opening the hard disk at the same time, versus a printer has to be used uh, only by one processor. So a device driver basically locks, uh, and in order to provide mutual exclusion, or there there is only one thread access in the device driver of the printer and so on. Uh, we have read-only devices, write-only devices, and read-write devices like mouse, printer, hard disk, for examples of each. Uh, we have uh, I/O scheduling. We will talk about in a moment uh, the buffering of I/O, caching of I/O, pull, pulling. Uh, sorry, pooling. Uh, pooling is uh, device reservation and error handling. Also, uh, extra services we need. Uh, so, if we should talk a little bit about scheduling uh, for efficiency of operations, especially for hardware. The uh, correct order of uh, operations is very important. 
especially when you have um, slow hardware with mechanical uh, moments. Uh, hard is the good example for that. We need a strategy, the IO strategy. Uh, so if you, for example, access the start of the disk, end of the disk, start of the disk, end of the disk, and this sequence, you will end up in this moment of hat. And the moment of the diskette is uh, one of the largest time consuming tasks of IO. Uh, so you need to have some strategy. So you build up some single pattern. So with a single head moment, you can read and write everything. Uh, so IO scheduling does that. Uh, it will get a set of IO requests and turns this optimal order and executes that in that optimal order. Uh, and if it is a competitive environment, there are many, many uh, requests coming from different processes. You also have this fairness, et cetera, in the uh, scheduling. Uh, criteria uh, in addition to uh, speed optimization. Uh, so the minimizing this uh, latency, this latency is uh, important. So we should minimize latency for small transfers and maximize throughput at the same time. Uh, that means if there are uh, many blocks uh, read uh, continuously or written continuously, uh, especially on the same track, when our diskette is in the same track, we can actually, without any head moment, we can read whole track or we can write whole track. If there are continuous accessing blocks, we can uh, maximizing throughput through that. Okay. Uh, uh, the, all of the criteria is defined by this block. Uh, structure or your IO uh, structure. What you can do, uh, you can do one of the uh, things you can do is basically having this uh, FIFO. And the FIFO case, you send the instructions in the same order, they are arriving the operating system. And as I said, there are zigzag moments and it will. Uh, lose a lot of seed time. Uh, actually, we have uh, the major delay is uh, the track movement here. We have multiple uh, reading, multiple plays, and multiple readers on the same track. So this movement, the hard disk is spinning like that. This movement is one of the time consuming ones. And once it is adjusted on the track, also we have rotational delays. First, the adjustment of the uh, detection of the start of the track, then the rotational delay will uh, be the total cost of IO. Uh, so what we can do uh, instead of uh, FIFO. Uh, the, uh, sorry. Next thing we can do is the uh, shortest seek time first. So what we do is currently at, we are at track uh, N and then among the alternatives we are going to keep, pick uh, the close to N, uh, closest one to N. Uh, this is actually something looking good. However, we have an issue. If your data is on the borders of your harvest, so you always go the near one. So the middle tracks are highly favored. And in some, if you make some statistical distribution, you will see that all of your IO going on this uh, middle tracks and the uh, marginal track the, of the end or start of the harvest uh, are rarely uh, visited. Uh, so this is not an option. Uh, so the next thing is called uh, scan the elevator algorithm. So basically, you do you uh, fix on your direction. As long as you're go going on one direction, the uh, you keep 
going on that direction. Because uh, going back has some cost while there is something to read in your in front of you. So you don't go back until you read the last one in your front, you follow that. You go back and continue. Uh, so th this is like a sorting algorithm. It sorts all of the tracks in your direction. And while you are going in that direction, you read all of them. And when you switch the, your direction, you sort in reverse order and access them. Uh, in this way, uh, you don't have this exact moment. Until the end, go, then go back, until the beginning, until the end, until the beginning, and the last time. And C scan algorithm, it is uh, simply the variation of scan, which has uh, all of the instructions are in one direction. Other direction, you just uh, fastly go back, do not do any operation. So you Read, 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 like a typewriter. Read, 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 I read all of them. When I hit at the end, I go back, switch my direction. And actually, there is a cost here that is not shown in the slide. So I have a cost of going from here to here. Then I hit the next one, next one, next one. And I am going to finish. Um, this is the uh, overhead of the scan algorithm. Um, so there are 12 tracks in the uh, right direction, 15 tracks for long feedback, and five tracks in the uh, backward direction. As a result, you will end up in 32, 32 uh, track visited. Um, how, how about the alternative like P4? For FIFO, uh, the arrival time of the tracks are also important. So you can have, for example, uh, one here, a synthesis, two here. This is three. This is four. This is five. Okay. If you Go like that, it will be some scan to here. One, two, two, three, three, four, four, five. Okay. And if you add all of them, those five requests will end up in quite a large time. So if I go under, let us short do shortest seek time first. In that case, I'm going to one and then uh, two and three available at the same time. Assume it is like that. Two, then after three. Uh, so I, or when I'm moving one, two come, then three come. So I, instead of two, I go three. And when I'm, when I'm going back to two, four and five arrive. So I go to two, five, then I go back to four. As I said, problem here is when I'm doing the operation, if new middle uh, request, and, uh, new request to middle uh, blocks arrive, I always go uh, having, such movements in the uh, middle tracks, and I will never go to uh, tracks at the end or at the beginning. Uh, not all of the devices require IO scheduling. We have solid state disks popular. 
so a little bit uh, expensive, but uh, available at the moment. You can buy a terabyte SSD. Uh, but uh, they don't have this IOS scheduling requirement, but they have uh, other uh, problems. Uh, they are basically a block based, read only access, which is fast and there is no restriction. Uh, but writes are uh, restricted, only empty blocks can be written. Uh, so, uh, what you need to do is you need to erase a larger set of blocks. Then you can start writing them. Uh, and erase cycle is more expensive and also it is uh, limited. So, for example, you may have 32 kilobytes of blocks, but erase, erase is uh, 512 bytes. Uh, because their characteristics, is actually, they are uh, just improvement over. Uh, old technology of uh, erasable, uh, electronically erasable programmable uh, ROM, uh, such as like block or partially erasable uh, EPROMs. Uh, erasing is slow, and we have a total erase cycle limit, like 10,000 times if you erase a larger block uh, or segment, uh, that segment will have too many. Uh, errors that you cannot uh, correct uh, occurring, so you cannot uh, keep using them if you like reliable data. Uh, so basically, a uh, single bit update requires erasing a whole segment and write uh, the 32 kilobytes of data. Uh, even if you use caching, uh, write caching and so on, this, is, this has some problem. So the uh, the solution is uh, only write modified blocks on erase segments, not in the actual orders, not in their actual offset. Uh, so you have this distinction of logical block versus actual block. And you have an internal table of this mapping, actual block and logical block mapping. So you, you actually write like a tape, one after another sequentially. But in uh, this table, you keep the mapping so that it will look like it was randomly uh, accessed and randomly written different areas of the disk. Uh, and when all operating system asks for this logical block from this mapping, you can recover the actual written position and do that. This is called sphere leveling or write amplification. Uh, the most hardware, most SSDs provide this in hardware. This is called FDL, fast transition layer. Uh, implemented in the SSD, sometimes it will have some delay in uh, initialization uh, time of the hardware, but it is usually very fast, and operating system doesn't have any idea of it. It will make your uh, SSD live longer and uh, keep its um, speed and so on. Uh, the Operating system doesn't have a solution to that because it's internal. But uh, otherwise, if there is no hardware support, operating system can use special file system uh, to deal with such SSDs. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, have a talk about that. Uh, we have a couple of. Uh, actually, I have this many slides. Uh, uh, more advanced uh, operations we need to uh, do in the IOS subsystem. Uh, hard disk management is much more difficult if you have uh, the failures of disk, changing of disk. Uh, you like your disk space to be uh, groaning and shrinking, uh, adding new disk or replacing existing disk and so on. So usually we the operating system provides a logic layer on top of the existing uh, hard disk hardware, which is called logical volume management, so that you have a logical virtual uh, volume, and from existing hardware, uh, existing uh, disk, you uh, keep this uh, assembled. Uh, 
so that you can uh, grow and shrink uh, the space. Also, uh, for redundancy and reliability, we have uh, rates redundant area of independent disks, so that you can have um, either for efficiency instead of uh, writing in a single request, uh, you can write in parallel both disks. And they will look like a single disk, but you write in parallel. This calls uh, zero stripe. Uh, for redundancy, you can use uh, rate level one. So all writes are replicated uh, in two hard disks in parallel. So there are two copies of the same block in both of the disks. If one of them fails automatically, system will uh, keep serving you from the other one, and you can replace uh, the failure fail disk uh, uh, by that time. Uh, or we can have combinations of the zero plus one, or we have parity based rate five and so on. Uh, however, rate is something expensive, so it is best implemented in hardware and on an operating system we have soft rate. We uh, already mentioned in page cache, so I am not repeating that. Uh, file cache is the same thing in the uh, file uh, level. Uh, so, the next thing is buffering. Buffering is different than caching because caching is already uh, in the uh, a general mechanism in the operating system and it is valid for all of the devices. Uh, so all devices share the same page page. Uh, but buffering is per uh, uh, device driver. So uh, each device driver implements its own buffering mechanism if it is applicable, uh, like a printer, for example. Page-based buffering mechanism, a terminal can provide a line-based buffering mechanism, uh, and so on. Uh, so this is, has a couple of uh, purposes because we can have speed mismatch. The processor is too fast, but the device can be slow or vice versa sometimes. Uh, the, for example, operating system cannot uh, handle the interrupts in the exact synchronous time, so we have to keep uh, the uh, read bytes in some buffers during that, for example, if it, it might be the case. Uh, so the operating system is too busy and the bytes read from network are put into queue, for example, this is a buffer. Uh, you may have different data transfer sizes for your user program sent uh, one megabyte of uh, printer data, but your printer has to uh, print page by page uh, or in networking for example we have the typical uh, audio sizes like 1.5 kilobytes something uh, but you send 10 kilobytes of data so we need some sort of buffer also we provide this copy semantics for application we, in the user level we pass a pointer send it to the device and we update that pointer. What will happen if you do not have any buffer? Uh, that value uh, change you made will be reflected on the output. So you send the page to the printers, you update your buffer, printer will print, print the new content of the buffer, which is something you don't like most of the time. Uh, so we have uh, the unbuffer input is something like this from directly modem to user space. And the buffer you make in the user space. Uh, and the more realistic scenario is this one, buffering in the kernel. So the device puts data into kernel buffer and it is transferred to the user space. If you like to reuse that buffer, you have to wait. Or you can use a double buffering mechanism so that you send it here 
while it is transferred to the user space, your next read is sent to the other buffer and you switch like that. We have uh, different mechanisms. We can have master buffers, per request buffers, and so on as well. Uh, and in the networking, we have the network controller transmitting network. And sometimes, depending on the protocol, you will have retransmit uh, uh, and so on. So that means you will have uh, multiple copies of the packet can be available. You transmit one, you have a timeout, you transmit another one. That is in the interface card buffer, kernel buffer, user space. So uh, usually this socket layer handle uh, this uh, uniqueness of the packets at the user level, but between them in the kernel, you can have multiple copies. Uh, so we have uh, some of the IO is blocking. So that means uh, you, if you like to wait until IO completes, uh, you put into uh, some blocking state. Reads are usually blocked, but you can have writes also blocked in synchronous uh, IO request in the user level, for example. When uh, the IO is actually completing, we will have interrupt device driver, expect the system call, and system call will wake the process back. And the uh, non blocking case, uh, you just send the request for IO and then continue because your IO will uh, not return a success or failure. It will just uh, be delivered and the user space uh, function will return back uh, instantly. Uh, so that the user program can do useful things. And this is called non-blocking IO. Uh, it is it may be provided uh, by the user space library, C library and so on. Uh, it has this especially uh, uh, advantage, as I said, you can have uh, a single thread can deal with multiple data, uh, multiple um, devices, uh, write with this one without waiting, write the other one without waiting, write the other one, and so on. If necessary, you can uh, ask the results uh, or re uh, report, you can ask for a report of your uh, IO request. Uh, the better than that, the better than number blocking IO, you can also uh, have uh, in the operating system and user space libraries asynchronous uh, IO services, some uh, system calls for that. The idea is this one, you send your data, return immediately, and when data is actually written or actually data is all uh, read, uh, you will be waking up through some signal, some notification in higher level. Uh, it can be Unix-like signals, or uh, it can be the higher level library. Uh, so this is like a callback mechanism available in uh, some languages. So on errors, call this function. On success, call this function. Types of programming is also possible. And sometimes user uh, operating system has to be involved on that by providing special uh, system calls for uh, that asynchronous IO instruction. Uh, another issue in IO, uh, IO is pooling. Uh, so it is basically a buffer for uh, holding this output for a device. Uh, spooling is, has one major uh, example, which is the printer. Uh, so the rights could should be exclusive. It is not a shared. Uh, however, programs doesn't like to wait for their uh, turn uh, of printing. So what you can basically do is you can uh, keep request in separate areas and spool areas, and eventually the uh, printer is going to be assigned to that request and printouts should be available after that. Uh, so usually we use directories as a set for spooling purposes. Uh, it, they are kept on the front disk or the file and when uh, the printout is finished we may have 
uh, some notification and so on. Uh, spooling is also available in emails and uh, such networking applications as well. Uh, usually, spooling is implemented in the uh, uh, user space. It is not uh, the kernel uh, functionality. Uh, we have a daemon uh, handling uh, the spooling and queues and so on, uh, so that you grant access uh, to the printer only that daemon. And this way, you provide this mutual access. Error handling is another issue. Uh, so the uh, errors should be reported up to uh, points of interest, which is the user space program. Uh, also, some of the errors uh, can be in handled internally by retries, timeouts, and uh, so on. If it is not recoverable, it should be reported properly or by some failures, logs, and so on. Because if your hard disk is not working anymore and you didn't try, you are not writing blocks you like to write, you like to know it. Uh, some of the errors are permanent, some of them are recoverable. And uh, sometimes you need to, for example, mark that area. Some, for example, in hard disk, we have uh, invert blocks. So what you can do is you can mark that block as that block and you continue oper your operation with the remaining blocks. Uh, so we, th these are also the issues a uh, kernel should have. So uh, this is for uh, chapter IO. Uh, as I said uh, before, all your questions are welcome in uh, the uh, department forum uh, call and so on. Uh, please ask questions and clarifications so that we can help you better. Uh, thank you very much. I'll see you in interactive classes. Bye-bye.